Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, and thanks so much for tuning in to Pods of the Multiverse, Season 2. We are an unofficial Dungeons & Dragons podcast. We play 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. My name is Scala. I portray the world of Ravnica. And with me are my three friends portraying the characters navigating that world. My name is Jeppy, and I play Illipel, the half-elf warlock. I mean, bard. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) I'm Jimmy. I play Clork, the Izzet Engineer Goblin, who uh, has been making things explode since 10,044. Oh, man. That deep lore. That absolute (laughs) deep lore. (laughs) That's right. I can show you my junior Blast Seeker credentials. Nice. Um, I'm Andy. I play the Grave Moss Gavel Swinging... Ice knife slinging Alwyn, the Golgari druid. The rootinous tootinous. Yeah. Most hooting and hollerinous. All right, you know what? In all the undercity. Uh, man, that gives me some ideas. Uh, but unfortunately, all of this has been pre recorded, so uh, we'll have to wait on those. In any case, uh, this is your weekly dead horse beating of. Or in this case, the weekly gibbering mouth or beating (laughs) you know we we would like to get more people to listen to our content so if you like it you can help that happen by giving an engagement and helping it ascend in the algorithm let's begin the episode all right let's get into it let's do our little recap quiz show where the game was last week and the points i've decided now do matter they do matter. Buzz, buzz, <laughs> Increasingly. buzz. Buzz, Andy, wh- wh- what would you like to recap for the audience? Oh, man. So Alwyn took the party back to Stonehaven and kind of did his whole personal arc in one game. Okay, that's a point. Buzz, buzz. Shimmy. Illipel did some business, too, before that happened. Yeah, thank you, Andy. <laughs> You're welcome. I guess my business doesn't I- matter because I didn't get my arc resolved in one game. But no, I did some business. What business did I do? You know, I'm just being a generally honest Abe, you know? So that's going to be a negative point for you. (laughs) Illipel got a warlock spell slot, which has me as a player extremely fucking concerned. Yeah. Yeah, what? (laughs) For one point, where did you get that warlock spell slot from? He probably doesn't remember. Uh, The ring of metal, right? Yes. So I'm at zero now? You're back at zero. Cool. Where did I get the ring of metal from? Garavash. Scal is getting at the dream that you had. Not necessarily. That's fine. Garavash gave you a ring. It gave you a warlock spell slot. Yeah, and then Buansamdi talked to me mm. in my dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got that. We found Ed. We brought him home. Well, who was Ed with? Buzz Buzz, Dr. Taganti. Oh, damn. Where where were Ed and Dr. Taganti? Down uh, in the... Down the, deep in the The gyre, city, the primordial the gyre. gyre. Neither well, no, of you the buzzed object. in. Buzz. Buzz. Oh, fuck. At, the, at the primordial gyre place. The sanctum of the primordial Thank gyre. You. I'll give you half a point for that. Okay, fuck. We fought a fucked up mouth monster. Yeah. Indeed you did. There's a point. Buzz, buzz. Vraska, buzz. <laughs> Jeffy, what's up? <laughs> Damn it. The names of the objects they were seeking to use are the widening and tightening gyre. Correct. Buzz. <laughs> yes, Andy. Vraska had already sent Golgari assassins to kill Edric, but... We fought them off. They died. They turned into the gibbering mouther. We killed. Well, they that. fused with it, right? Yeah, it was gross. This thing seems to like siphon death, which is why they want to keep it isolated. I thought it turned them into that. It took their bodies and made it into a big ball of flesh. Yes, that's correct, Jimmy. You get a point for that. Thank you. I don't feel like I deserve that. But <laughs> anything else? Edric got in some trouble. Rena gave him a mouth lashing for sure, and then we went to bed. Alwyn had some words. Pretty cross words. Threw some words at him. Clark's hankering for a hot dog. Oh my god. Oh my god, oh, the hot right. dog. That was priceless. Probably the best joke of the game so far. That was pretty good. With four points, Jimmy gets our inspiration die for hey. this game. Really? Did I, what did <laughs> I come in? Net surprising. one? You came in net two. Look at that. <laughs> One of these games, I'll get the inspiration. Not that you need it when you yourself are so inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we've left off in Stonehaven, but you're on downtime. We can sort of abstract time from here until you're called back. What does everybody want to do? 
Oh, I forgot I got a fancy new gavel. Oh, uh, yes, you did. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get a point for that, though. You get a gavel oh, well. for that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take it. Oh, are we all in the same general area? Yes, I'm going to say you're starting in, like in the Stonehaven. same room. I, I guess, I mean, we're all in the same room, right? You can be if you want to. Okay. If we are, I'm going to talk at my peeps. After a day well spent in the company of good friends, I am afraid to say I have some personal matters to attend to. But I wanted to extend each of you an invitation. In Precinct 2 is the Violet Rose, my quarters, and my business. You both are welcome there. Drinks on the house for as long as you'd like. What's the catch? You may have to talk to me. (laughs) It's kind of you here, Lapel. I assume this Violet Rose is... Well guarded? In its own peculiar way. These dimmy agents, they have me concerned. I think if we're to split up, we should try and keep as low profile as we can. Ah, the Violet Rose is a humble bar designed specifically to indulge the feasts of weaker people. Completely unassuming. If you say so. I trust that these next 12 days shall go by without any major hiccups or events. That being said, I am in need of your aid once more. Hopefully for the last time. But I am looking for a place called the Wilted Petal here in the Undercity. I kind of give a side eye. (sighs) What for? Reconnaissance. I don't know that you'll find anything there. It's as much an actual hole in the wall as you say your violet rose is. I said the violet rose is unassuming, not a hole in the wall. I'll forgive you this once, friend. Speaking of holes in the wall, I should be getting home. Cloak, you said you had some research you wanted to do. That's right. Would you mind sharing to your subordinates? Well, uh, you know, like I said, we all know what a sun disk is. But, uh, I thought I'd just <laughs> learn a little bit more about it and kind of maybe see who might have a motivation for taking such a thing. I'm not one to stifle the pursuit of information. While I do trust that you've near exceeded the limit of noble things about the sun disk, it is worth a try. Thanks for the endorsement. All right, we should get going. Um, just in terms of logistics, where would you like to go first? I guess let's just start with I take everybody up to the surface. Okay, yeah. You take everybody up to the surface. I'm going to say this doesn't even require a check. You've made this trip many times. You find yourselves back in the first precinct near the chambers of the Guild Pact and the Cathedral of Orjova and the Bank of Viscopa, all of these powerful institutions, and you can go where you like from here. In, in this case, I'll just lead Illipel towards the direction that I know the Wilted Petal to be, if you want to do Clork's stuff now. Yeah, it's easy enough to secure some sort of transport to where you're going. Me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll see if I can find some transport, if you have something fun plan there i don't have anything planned <laughs> this is downtime this is all right all for you guys okay clork is going to look for some means of transport up to nivix i should really get my own one of those transport things driving myself around the city i could probably build a better one than florp and gorp <laughs> maybe i'll spend my downtime doing that can i build a car <laughs> you can try anyway you see a very well-dressed goblin standing beside a small-sized carriage for small-sized inhabitants He sizes you up and says, Well, hello there, my friend. You look like you have places you need to be. Oh, do I? This guy thinks he's so fancy. Can you take me to Nivix? Absolutely, my good engineer friend. Please, step inside my carriage here, specifically for clientele of a more diminutive stature. What's that supposed to mean? People like you and I, people who don't grow too tall, uh, people who do not achieve great physical height. You don't know what I'm capable of. Eh, forgive me. I did not mean to insult. Clerk gets in the carriage. How much does this thing cost, anyway? For yourself to go down the promenade and reach the spire of Nivix, I shall require a single Xeno. No, I mean for the for the whole carriage. How much does the whole carriage cost? Eh, more than my salary, good sir. I don't care about your salary. Is it more than my salary? A gentle person usually does not ask such questions. Do I look like a gentle person to you? Oh my god. <laughs> we let Clark go on his own, and the first thing he does is fucking this. <laughs> he just <laughs> Clark is just gonna pick a fight with everybody. Alright, I give the guy a Zeno, and off we go. He gets into the driver's seat with these two like little ponies, and you head down the Transguild Promenade up to the Spire of Nivix. You can hear it crackling with power. There's claps of thunder intermittently as you get close, and this great 
tower with various orbs and power coils sticking off of it looms overhead. You go inside. What do you do? What's the inside like? It's like the outside, but on the inside. The chaos does sort of match the inside. There are stray power coils and arcane foci sort of floating haphazardly through the air. Errant arcs of electricity shooting between the walls. Ah, it's good to be back where things make sense. (laughs) Where would you like to go? Well, first of all, I'd like to go to my bunk. Okay. Which is... I'd assume maybe if not in the spire, somewhere in this complex. There's, yeah, there's sort of like a larger campus around and you could find where your sort of quarters are nearby there. Can I just describe what I picture my quarters to be? Yeah. So I enter into this sort of dormitory that has many, many cubby holes. These walls are covered in cubby holes and I climb up to the one that's been designated for me. Uh, It's just about goblin size and I crawl inside and I want to see if I have any, uh, any, any mail, anything have been left for me. It probably wouldn't be left in your cubby. There's a okay. mail room proper. Got it. And you have like a little box that you would have a key to, I imagine. Okay. But you can check your mail. You would probably have the first third of your paycheck for the two weeks here, which would be 12 Zenos, 30 Zibs. Okay. As well as another sort of note transcribed, it would say, um, Mr. Clark. Please submit a report on your exploits by the end of the week. Cheers, Ral Zarek. Ral Zarek. Where have I heard that name before? And then I look up at the very elaborate Is It League letterhead. <laughs> yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, right, right, of course. From the desk of the Guildmaster, it says in the top corner. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Well, I better get started on that later. Uh, first... So this is something I probably would have done several times in my career, is go and seek out information, perhaps as a library or other means of researching here. Oh, is there? Towards the top of the spire is a brainstorm attack, mm. where a number of research documents and notes are kept. You head up there, and this test archive is... A huge circular room with concentric rings of bookshelves on what appear to be these large conveyor belts that run from floor to ceiling. And you know that if you stand in the center of the room next to this massive sparking pylon that powers the whole apparatus and speak the name of a research topic, the entire library will start to move and bookshelves will change positions along the conveyor belt until one is dropped in front of you with books based on the relevant subject, dump them into a box where you're standing. Great. This is something I've done many times before, so I'm gonna go to this place. Am I still allowed in? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Are there any other people here? A few. No one you would immediately recognize, I don't think. Okay. So, yeah, I'm gonna go to the center of the room, and I'm going to speak the word sun disk. All right. The whole room starts to shake and turn, and as described, the shelves roll along and change position, and you can see a bit of steam forming in the air, and you can hear the sound of pneumatic pistons pushing these things into place, and out of the floor in front of you pops a bookshelf, tilts on a hinge, and it dumps a few books on the ground in front of you. All right. Where to begin? What are the titles of these books? There is Harnessing the Power of the Sun by Chiswick Fritz, A Theory of Solar Combustion by Bori Anden, and Relics of the Sun by Grix Kyrillix. Grix Kyrillix. That is a good goblin name right there. I'm going to start with that one. Relics of the Sun. All right. It appears to be a sort of log of a research excavation, and it tells about an ancient civilization that had some sort of solar religion. An early passage says... Excavations on the temples beneath the Utvara district have continued to yield exciting discoveries. Despite interference from the swarm, we have managed to recover several fascinating relics of pre-urban civilizations, perhaps older than even the Draco genius himself. While the language appears indecipherable, the pictograms on several relics show crude depictions of the movements of the celestial bodies. I hypothesize that these forgotten peoples practice some sort of astronomy as part of their culture's spiritual, or dare I say, scientific tradition. Some of the inferences these pre-urban peoples were able to draw are distinctly impressive. For example, we have recovered a large stone disc that appears to be a calendar, 
predicting the movements of the celestial bodies thousands of years in advance. The research team was able to identify the apotheosis of the Black Sun foretold on this calendar, carved at least 9,000 years before the event took place. Huh. And then a later passage reads, Further investigation into the calendar has revealed traces of divination and abjuration magic. For the enchantment to remain, even in fragments after millennia, suggests tremendous power. There are dozens of unprovable theories as to what the ancient spell could have been, but my personal conjecture is that the pre-urban peoples were able to draw mana not from the world itself, but from extra-dimensional sources. Research suggests that this sort of otherworldly mana, ether, is strongly influenced by the position of the sun, moon, and stars. And that's uh, the interesting things you get out of that book. Alright, extra-dimensional sources of mana. Now we're talking. Next, let's look at a theory of solar combustion, because that sounds more to the point. More to the point... The book begins. All right, strap in your eyeballs, because in traditional Blast Seeker fashion, I'm going to blow your mind. What if the sun <laughs> was just one giant chain reaction of explosions? Think about it. We know <laughs> that explosions release energy in the form of light and heat. We know the sun emits huge amounts of energy in the form of light and heat. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> it's the alien sky. <laughs> the book goes on to describe several theories of how the sun is a perpetual combustion engine. Like the way this guy thinks. As you're sort of reading this book, you hear someone call out, Hey, Dork! And you look up and see... Vazo, your supervisor, coming towards you. He's wearing a red robe with blue and bronze accents. He has several tubes of strange liquids strapped to his back. His face is marked with soot and burn marks behind his oversized goggles, and a strange contraption hanging on his waist periodically sputters and smokes. Dork, we thought you were dead! Looks like I owe some folks some zibs! I think I technically outrank you now, so you better look out. You better better watch who you're talking to. Ho ho ho! You think you outrank me? I got promoted again, I'm moving to bigger and better things, that means you're not my problem anymore. Guess who is the... Lead Alkalite. Fuck off! <laughs> Fuck right <laughs> off! The lead Alkalite on the Chamberlain Marie! This guy. Which guy? Did I not, did I not point my thumbs at myself? This guy! Oh. Alkalite, huh? <laughs> no! Yeah! Wow. <laughs> no! A chemist, though, who deals in substances with a pH greater than seven. <laughs> 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 you fucking jackass! Well, uh, uh, Congratulations, then, uh, on the uh, promotion. I wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you. Now, if you excuse me, I was in the middle of something here. Okay, you took me rubbing my success in your nose, rather on the chin, I may say. And I guess with that, I will leave you to whatever it is you're doing. I got no choice. You outrank me, you give it to me on the chin, and one day, you'll get it right back in return. But today is not that day. I got some reading to do. He scratches his chin a bit, adjusts his goggles, shrugs, and goes off towards the center of the brainstorm attack to do whatever he was doing here. Asshole. <laughs> I rolled a seven on my perception check and did not hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alkaline. Piece of shit. You are going to read Harnessing the Power of the Sun? That's right. Now, where was I? You open it up. The frivolous superstitions of Orjova bow in awe to the power of the sun. To them, it is an icon of power they would assume merely by transitive property of association. I propose a method to truly obtain the sun's power through the clever application of the physical properties of matter. In theory, a voltaic cell could be created to generate power in reaction to the movement of light waves by exposing the structure of a crystalline silicon to the light of the sun. It would theoretically be possible to stimulate the excitation of electrons, enabling the generation of power through what I term the photovoltaic effect. Theoretically, like all photonic power, this apparatus could be augmented through an array of mirrors and lenses to generate virtually limitless power. I foresee a future where every rooftop in Ravnica could be a platform for a photovoltaic cell, improving efficiency from the traditional barometric static conductor by 58%. The book goes on to show design diagrams and experimental notes. 
I want to look at these design diagrams and experimental notes and see if I can understand it really at all. Does the tech check out? Roll intelligence, and you can add your proficiency for your engineering. It's only a nine. It's a little far-fetched. A solar panel? Uh, it's kind of crazy. I don't get any of this. Who came up with this junk? Chizix Fritz. Chizix Fritz. Fun fact, as I was looking up solar power for the beginning of this book, apparently Charles Fritz was the guy who, um, one of the guys who originally worked on, like, early solar power. The more you know. The more you know. Photovoltaic, huh? Now they're just making up words. All right, but who would want to steal the sun disk? So what I can conclude from this, taking out my notepad and just sort of in broad strokes, can I keep these books? For a while. I'm going to take these books. But uh, in my notepad, I'm going to make a special note of the pre-urban people of Ravnica and with a little bit of conjecture, maybe assume that the sun disk in question for us is a pre-urban artifact that is intended to draw mana from an extra-dimensional source, otherwise known as ether. Okay, very cool. That's kind of all I came for. Is Vazo okay. still here? He probably came and took his books and left. Okay, got nothing else to say to that guy for now. Unless there's something else you want to say to that guy. Then he can be here. Nah, he'll get what's coming to him in the end. Vazo. You know, Vazo is sort of just the embodiment of meet the new boss, same as the old boss. All right, so... That's all that I had to do. Okay. You're just going to kind of go back to your little hole in the wall, so to speak? I would sleep there tonight and for the next however many days unless something were to come up. Otherwise, this is vacation time for Clork. Honest downtime. He's not going to do too much work. Okay. You open up the sleep menu in Skyrim yep. and you click 48 hours. Yep. You do that and then you do it seven more times. <laughs> That's right. Yep, just wait. Just stand yeah. here in the library and wait for 24 hours at a time. Do you write your report? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, I should uh, <laughs> go find a, uh, a workspace to write my report. Okay. We can cut to somebody else before you turn in that report. Yeah, let's do the Alwyn takes Illipel to the Wilted Petal. Sounds good. Alwyn takes Illipel to the Wilted Petal. Do you want to make me do any rolls for getting there or... Unless you want to go there in a very specific manner, I would say no. I mean, I definitely want to try and keep a low profile. Or honestly, at this point, knowing what we know about everything going on underground, I think we should be, like, watching our backs wherever we go. Then I would say roll stealth if you want to go there in a relatively inconspicuous manner. I got a 16. But I got a 15. Okay. You pass through on whatever path you decide to take relatively unnoticed. By any demir agents, you conspiracy theorist. For those listening, Andy smiled, knowing that he has lost his mind. You seem to forget, Illipel. I didn't say that as Illipel. <laughs> Go ahead. They were waiting for us. They were waiting for us at Cassio's apartment. We have to be careful. They know there are guild-packed agents looking for them. They were waiting for us at a destination they knew we'd be. This is downtime. I'd like to think any suspicious characters or agents of disinterested guilds would be respectful of our vacation. <laughs> I, I, I just roll my eyes and keep going. We head into the Undercity towards the Wilted Petal. And eventually you come to it, a unassuming door carved into the side of a tunnel. It has a creaky wooden sign hanging above the door with a engraving depicting a dying rose dropping its petals. What sort of reconnaissance could you possibly have down here? A place like this? I have done good authority that this place is owned by someone of particular value to me. I think you may be able to guess who. I'd rather not say her name in such close proximity. I may be forgetting how much Illipel said in their private conversation versus how much they told Alwyn when they got to Stonehaven. I think you know her name. Right. I think you know that I have history with her, and I think you know that I believe she's up to some bad shit. Okay. I trust you not to make a scene. Illipel will put a hand on Alwyn's shoulder. Yeah, you can certainly trust me. Admittedly, it will be hard to keep a low profile for me, but I'm grateful you came. If I may borrow that robe, I do think I would be relatively unnoticed. Ah. <sighs> I see. Let me do you one better. And then you see Alwyn raise his hand 
gesturing over the top of the two of them, and you see dark spores circling around and turn into shadows as I cast Paths Without Trace. We now both have a plus 10 to all stealth checks. Okay. Very good. That's pretty cool. And I also give them my cloak. Okay. You're now wearing two cloaks, Illipel. I am. You are a fashion disaster. The perfume makes up for it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Part of casting Pass Without Trace is also covering Illipel in mud to hide the perfume. Oh, that's much better. You motherfucker. <laughs> all right. So how are you going inside? I will go in first. Just to kind of block their coming. Okay. And then basically as soon as I see Illipel come in, I will kind of stick to the walls and kind of stay out of the way while still keeping an eye on everything. All right. As you open the door, are you trying to be sneaky as you go inside here? I've been here before, so I kind of, I would remember a bit about the layout. You know, it's it's like a dive tavern. Yeah, so I just go in and maybe I sit at the same corner where I was in the first game or something. You know, just a yeah. dark corner where I can sort of keep an eye on things. As you step inside, the bartender notices you. Ah, oh, welcome back, hon. Did that job work out for you? A manner of speaking, I'll just... Take a drink at my table, thank you. Certainly. Illipel, could you roll me some stealth as you're trying to sneak in behind as this is going on? 29, if I'm getting plus 10, right? Yep. 29. Hmm. She rolled high. Oh, come on. But not that high. Okay. (laughs) She can fuck off. (laughs) You do see the familiar figure of the woman you cheated out of her business on Elgast standing behind the bar cheated out yeah i fucking thought so oh that's right the other pcs didn't know don't know the history no they don't know she is a middle-aged elven woman she's got pale skin and she's sort of dressed down from what you remember her as it's just a simple dress patched up where it might be torn with moss and ivy and she doesn't seem to notice you as she has this conversation with alwyn and then goes back to her work what do you do I'll sit at the table for now. Okay. As we're walking or, you know, walking through and probably, I guess, heading towards the table, I'll just say, that is her. That one right there. Do you see her? You've got to be kidding me, Illabel. She's just a tavern owner. What did you do to her? And not very long ago, I was just a tavern owner. And now I'm working for the Guild Pact on a conspiracy that may unravel all of Ravnica. No one is just what they seem, human. Do your reconnaissance. I'll keep watch. Maybe best we not sit near each other. Oi. Anel is behind the bar now. Like where? Where is she exactly? She's tending the bar. She's currently making a cup of tea for Alwyn. Okay. Is there anyone else that works here? Doesn't appear so. All right. I'm going to sit at another table for now. Actually, do I see other patrons like leaning against the wall? Is that normal? There appears to be enough seating that everyone is seated. You could probably find a place to sit, but... okay. If you wanted to lean against the wall... I just want to look inconspicuous, so if sitting down is more the way to go, then I'll do that. Sure. I'm going to keep your 29 stealth. You remain inconspicuous. Cool. Anything else you're going to do? I'd like to, as best I can, see what's behind the bar. Are there doors? Like, There's got to be more to this building where they keep stuff, right? There's a sort of door that you would presume, based on your knowledge of the layouts of these places, lead back into a kitchen. There's a staircase leading down that Alwyn could tell you leads to the rooms where people stay the night okay okay if there's a patron nearby i'd like to just strike up a conversation with a stranger okay you start talking with a stranger a dev car an elf is sitting at a table nearby nursing a bowl of mushroom stew what's their name you would have to ask his name fair ah mushroom stew huh a voice out of the shadows with a 29 stealth says <laughs> scaring the shit out of this trail I may have some particularly interesting mushrooms waiting for me back at my establishment. How are you today, sir? Curious as to why you are talking to me. Ah, the saddest reason of all, I'm afraid. Frightfully bored. Mm. I won't say that day after day of sifting through the slop is the most exciting or fulfilling work in the world, but, you know, it keeps a floor under my feet. (laughs) Very nice. I can relate to that, the monotony of... Day in, day out, the same activity over and over again. It does make one want to retreat to an establishment such as this. Do you come here often? Time to time when I'm in the area. What's the best thing on the menu? They got this, well, it's a mushroom, but they make it in a way that it tastes like bacon. Ah, very nice. 
I'll have to try it sometime. Okay. Say, I just came quite a long ways to get here. My legs are dreadfully tired. Would you mind putting in an order for me? And to make it worth your while, I'll give you two Xenos for the trouble, so you can order whatever you'd like. <laughs> well, all right. That's about as much as I'm going to make today. You got a deal. I'll give him two and a half. Okay. I presume he's going to go put in the order for me. Yeah, what's the order? The thingy, the, the, the fucking mushroom, the bacon mushroom thing. All right, yeah. At some point during all of this, Alwyn, Nell brings you your tea. Let me know if there's anything else I can do for you, hon. And heads back behind the bar. I would like to ask her. <sighs> nope. Sorry, nothing. Okay. She heads back behind the bar. She eventually comes back to the Dev Car and Elf's table, leaves the bacon there. Wait, does she go and cook it? No, there's like a flap. Right. Jeppy, if you were looking for an opportunity to go, she talked to me. Like, come on. Okay. The entire time, I'm just like, Illabel, do something. You you, t- you said one fucking word to her. How am I going to run back while you do that? Have a dialogue with her. I'll go run. Before she walks away, I'll, I'll ask, is there a chance that my room is still available? Oh, well, uh, not the one that you were in, but I've got rooms unbooked for the night. I apologize. Any room will do. Thank you. While they're talking, I'm going to run to the back of the bar. You're going to... Okay. Make me one more stealth check as you do this. Okay. 25. Okay. You are back behind the bar. What do you do? There's various taps hooked up to kegs and other sorts of glassware and things of that nature. It's a bar. Cool. Where's that staircase? Not here. There's a door to Jeppy, the- it's like a tavern. There's stairs that go to rooms where people sleep. It's not a secret thing. I didn't say it was, but I, I asked earlier what's behind the bar I want to investigate, and you said a staircase. Sorry, there's a door that leads into the kitchen, and then somewhere else in the room, there's a staircase leading down to where Alwyn could tell you are the rooms. Okay. I, yeah, because I asked what's behind the bar, and you said both of those things at the same time. Sorry, they were two separate things. Okay. Who, who thinks that, like, places where people in a hotel go to their rooms is behind a bar? Who thinks that? Sorry, I don't, I don't go to a lot of underground um, taverns, Andy, in real life in Florida. Um, so I'm a little out of my wheelhouse, but I'm going to learn as we go. Would you like to go into the kitchen? I feel like I got no choice now. Oh, yeah, let's do the kitchen. Okay, you go into the kitchen. This is certainly going in an unexpected direction. Is it, though? Is it, though? It's Jeppy. <laughs> Let me roll perception for that. Watch, her chef is going to be like a level 10 minotaur or something. Okay, this doesn't have great perception. Yeah, not going to make a 25. You see, working at the stove, a skeleton. Normal chef stuff. Coated in a very familiar blue substance. Fuck. Okay. What? Interesting. No. I'm not going to do anything about that. All right, well, I'm going to try and stay out of its way. I don't really know what the kitchen layout is, but I'm assuming we're going to do some Jurassic Park raptors in the kitchen navigation thing. While I'm doing whatever I can to stay out of sight, is there either another room with Anel Gale's, like office or a desk area or something like that. There does appear to be a door to another room behind the kitchen. All right, we're going to go for it. I'm going to try and stay out of sight. Okay, you get to the door. I'm going to keep your 25 stealth for this room. You try it, it is locked. Okay. All right, I don't have a lockpick, but I am wondering. I could either fashion something to jimmy the lock with a loot string. I just don't know what kind of roll I would need to do to do that. I'm going to say sleight of hand at disadvantage with an improvised tool. Okay, fair. First roll is a 16. My sleight of hand is 5. That's 21. Second roll is a 14. So 19. Make me one more stealth check while you're doing this. (laughs) That's the 22. Okay. The eternalized warrior continues to work at the hob, unaware of your presence so far. Jesus. You are working on the lock. It doesn't appear to open, but you don't appear to have failed so much that you couldn't try again. Okay. Gonna try. Is this also at disadvantage? Still at disadvantage. Okay. You don't have thieves tools. Okay. It's an 18 on the dice and a 17 on the dice, so plus it's 22 this time. 22. The lock clicks. Jeez. Make me one more stealth check. You do not want me in this fucking room. <laughs> okay. Like, you're making you noise, other picking ways a lock. To do it, too. The circumstances have changed. <laughs> yeah. New check. Um, um, yeah, th- this, is a, this is a 20. Okay. 
It still does not seem to see you Ah. as it goes over to the central prep table and starts, like, chopping some mushrooms. Uh, And you open the door and you slip inside. All right. What do I see? You see an office, a desk, a sort of cabinet with some odd reagents and other spellcasting supplies, a couple of bookshelves with maybe ledgers and, and documents and things of that nature, and another with books on arcane magics and necromancy or things of that nature. All right. I'm going to start with the desk. I'll try all the the drawers. I'll see what's on top of the desk. And... Okay. Let me check something real quick. Oh. Alwyn is just keeping an eye on her. Yep. She's just working at the bar. Okay. Make me a deck save. One second. No. <laughs> well, I'm typing notes. Fuck you. Yes. <laughs> deck save. That is uh, 16. Okay. There is a deafening boom. As you open one of the uh, drawers on this desk and a protective rune alights and you take... Oh, I rolled kind of low. 15 points of thunder damage. Oh, that's low. Cool. And, um... Do I hear this? I feel like uh, you hear a dull thud. You would see Nell sort of look up and head back into the kitchen. I'm going to try and stop her. Stop her how? So I hear the thud and she looks around and I come up to the bar and start asking her about how she makes her tea. Okay. (laughs) I feel like let's roll initiative for this. Oh, God damn you. I sort of get up and walk, walk towards the bar and say, This tea is awfully good today. I'd like to know what you put in it that makes the mold so fresh. With my whopping five initiative. Okay. What'd you get for your initiative, Illipel? As I reach and grab whatever papers and ledger book I can, I will start to run out of the office with an initiative of 15. 15. What's your modifier? Three. Okay. Looks like somebody else rolled a 15. Illipel, you grab some papers from the desk and a book from on top of it, and you start... Heading out the door, you can probably get through the kitchen and out into the barroom proper with your movement. Anything else you're doing? How susceptible to suggestion are the Eternal Warriors? You've never tried before. You don't know. Eh, I'd rather not engage them if I don't have to. I grew up in restaurants, so like a lot of them have little windows through the doors that you can see into and out of the kitchen. Can I see? Is there a window in this door where I can see what's going on back in the bar area before I open the door? You know those sort of windows that you can pull open and... Yeah, there's one of those. One of those. Can I pull it open and see what's going on? Yeah, pull it open. All right, cool. I'm assuming I see An El talking with Alwyn. Yep, Alwyn has come up to her. She's still sort of looking towards the back, though, and she... She doesn't notice you opening this flap door, though. Her perception roll was pretty bad. Wonderful. I'm going to try and like hide behind a cutting counter or whatever I can near the door. All right, roll stealth. Gonna use your action to hide. The Eternal didn't hear the boom? It did. It hasn't gone yet. Oh. 29. Fair. Okay. Thank fuck for Pass Without Trace. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. Okay, that's you. Now the Dreadhorde Eternal goes. It heads over into the office and begins looking around. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Love that. Love that. And now, let's resolve this all at once. Alwyn, can you make a deception check? Sure. I'll try. That's a three plus nothing. She got a nat 20 on her insight roll. She says to you politely, Well, I can answer that for you in a minute, hon, but I gotta check up on something in the back real quick. Stove might have caught fire. And she she heads back towards the kitchen and into the door. Would I have also gotten a chance to notice Illipel open and close the window? Make a perception check. I don't remember what... I'm competing with, but that is a 22. I think Jeffy got a 29 on stealth for on this that round. one? Okay, <laughs> fuck. Quite sneaky. I've still got Pass Without Trace up, so I'm going to trust that Illipel has enough time to hide, and I'm going to let her go. Okay. She heads into the back. She notices that her office door is open and that the Dread Horde Eternal is looking around inside of it. Does she close the door between the bar and the kitchen on her way in? Sort of just swings closed naturally behind her. When I see that it's open, do I see that the office door is also open and that there is an Eternal past it? You probably wouldn't be able to see that from this angle. Oh, man. (laughs) I don't know what's going on, but... (laughs) 
I don't know if I've ever seen Scala make these faces. I don't know what's in your head right now. I don't know what's going to happen. This is great. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen either. <laughs> oh. She knows someone's broken into her office. She doesn't know where they are, which she can't. Oh, no. Okay, she mutters an incantation as she pulls a bit of calamari out of her belt pouch, and then she steps back out of the kitchen, and the entire kitchen becomes filled with these writhing, grasping tentacles of dark energy that twist and grab at you, Illipel. As we go back to your turn, can you make me a dexterity save? Yep. Okay, that is a dirty 20. You are not grabbed by these black tentacles. Sweet. It's your turn. What's up into your kitchen? What's going on? Oh, nothing to worry about, hon. I just think we have a little rat problem. Fuck. Hold on. Let me think here. All right. Fuck it. I'm using pyrotechnics to create a cloud of smoke. Okay. Cool. I just create this shit. You make a cloud of smoke. And I'm going to... I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to book it. Okay. And try to get the fuck out of the bar. You do that, right? She can't see you through the cloud of smoke. You have enough movement to do this and make it to the door and head outside the bar. That's your turn. The Dread Horde warrior continues looking around in the office for a thief. Let's give it up for the Dread Horde. Play of the game, no, no doubt. Ambling around the office, not doing anything. It's a mindless undead creature. <laughs> it's great. Not doing their best. We appreciate it. She gave it a command to find out what that was, and it's doing its best. We're all proud of it. <laughs> she is going to cast Gust of Wind, dispersing the smoke cloud, but when the smoke clears, you are not in sight. Alwyn, she goes back behind the bar and offers to the room a general apology. Sorry about all the commotion, folks. You know the way rats are. If they start to nest, you've got a real problem on your hands. <laughs> For the disturbance, everyone can have a round on me. Alwyn, what do you do? After she says this, I kind of pull her aside. You know me. You know my family. You know I'm experienced in finding rats. I'm at your service, if you're looking for someone who has those skills. Oh, you're ever so kind, hon. But I'm not looking to bring in outside help for this particular issue. Fair enough. We can go out of initiative now. Yeah, I probably go and sit back at the table for a bit. Okay. And then I leave. Illipel will be nearby, you know, not at the door, but you know, trying to look through the things that they've just stolen, but keeping a low profile near enough so that when Alwyn comes out, they can signal to him. Okay. Make me just one more stealth check. Still at Pass Without Trace? Yeah. All right. That is a uh, 14. Okay. At disadvantage, a 7 is not going to notice you. You remain hidden as you leaf through these documents. The first document is a message on stationery bearing the spider symbol of the Dinrova Courier Service. It reads, Your little protege found themselves in my office today. Claimed to have some intelligence on a plot of yours to pit the guilds against each other. Smells like some exaggerated contrivance, but I'd keep laying low for now, in case they're sending more people sniffing after you. It's signed, 12. Uh, you see another letter in a very precise hand that reads, Nell, your work shows promise. Our mutual friend believes they could provide you the opportunity to acquire more raw materials. Our asset in Karuzda is volatile and will take the first opportunity she has to wriggle out from under our thumb. The consortium will need you to be ready when she does. It's signed, Bridger. You also see a coded message with symbols that Illipel would not be able to recognize, and a ledger that Illipel would clearly recognize as the clean book, showing transactions that cover well any money laundering that Anelgast might be involved in. Also amongst these papers is a rough map of the Undercity around the 10th, with several caverns marked Birdcage, question mark, and Snake Jar, question mark. Alwyn, you go out to Illipel. I sort of begin conjuring a series of thorn whips around my arm and my hand, and I say as I approach, Will, Ritz, did you find anything? Hope it was worth it. 
Save your fury, good friend. I appreciate you, and I do apologize for putting you through that, but it was necessary. In my hand are several documents. I shall get to working through them immediately. In the meantime, you should know, there was an Eternal back there. I immediately cast aside the thorn whips, break all sense of anger. You're serious. I cannot say that everything I believe to be true about Anogast is, but the one truth remains. There is more here than just a tavern owner. I understand this woman's vitriol, her lust for power, and in that lust, true evil lurks. Would we be able to ascertain any notions about, would she have had to capture that or reanimate it? Like, which seems more likely? I can, like, make a roll if you want me to. Yeah, okay, roll Arcana, but I'll tell you some things afterwards that you would just know as a member of the Swarm. Flat 10. Okay, you know just the things you would know as a member of the Swarm, in that these particular types of undead, they require someone to control them. Otherwise, they are inert. Oh, but we fought one of these, and it was not inert. Correct. Wait a minute. Okay. A large number of these corpses after the war were collected by the swarm. Mm. And they were put into secure storage and all the necromancers of the swarm were forbidden from using them. On Vraska's orders or somebody else's? It would have come probably from Storev, who is like the lead necromancer of the swarm. Cool. Well, she either found one that the rest of the swarm didn't. Well, she stole it. I think you're right, Upo. I think there is more here than just a tavern and its owner. I don't guess the sense of loyalty is tenuous at best. I think either scenario is equally believable. And perhaps sadly besides the point, all we know for sure are there are ill tidings in this building and beyond. For now, we should leave. Aye. Holding up the notes, I have plenty here to investigate. I may have a few questions to ask a Gorgon or two that we know. Let's go. All right. Cool. My plan at this point was to just go back to the Violet Rose for the remainder of the break. Not do okay. any, you know, just going to go there and just to get on with the adventure here. Yep. Very good. Okay. The only thing I want to do is like spread out all of the notes and everything. Illipel will also take their diplomat pack, kind of go through the notes they've assembled and take one note and put it to the side of what they've gathered at Anel Guest's tavern. And okay. then just for flavor, Illipel is going to grab a couple new perfumes for the next leg of the journey. I'll just go back to Stonehaven. Okay. But if Hedrick tries to talk to me at all, I don't talk to him. For the most part, he stays in his room. If you go to check on him... I don't. Okay. <laughs> then you don't see this him. This is like classic sibling drama. If he's going to talk to me, I'm not going to talk to him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yours, tell my brother I said. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Clark. All right. Clark's been hard at work at this report, so his cubby hole is now filled with handwritten notes and the goblin script, which is very technical language. It's got little squared off edges and very uh, detailed. And he's finally completed this first segment of the report that he intends to submit to Ralzarek. You would take a lift up to the Eyrie at the top of Nivix, where Niv Mizzet used to roost before he was appointed the Living Guild Pact. There's sort of an orrery at the pinnacle of the spire with several rings around it and various towers jutting forth from each of the rings, each one churning with different sorts of elemental energies. You see there's a flaming one and one that's sparking off erratically and one that seems to be bubbling with a volatile substance and another that is just a solid block of some sort of frozen matter. But in the center of this orrery is the Parun's office. Ralzarek is seated behind his desk. It's sort of comically small compared to the size of this room that used to be home to a great red dragon. His various apparatus are sort of laid off to the side of the desk, and he beckons you in. Ah, Mr. Clark! Clark looks down at his hand where he's written Ral Zarek. <laughs> nice. Hey, Ral. Ah, hello, please. I was informed you have my report ready. You will inform correctly. I hand him this report that I've written. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Special assignment, report by Clark, is it engineer. The sun disk, a precious artifact of great importance, was taken from the chamber of the guild back. 
Martin, a security guard on duty that night, was identified as the only first-hand witness. Martin's testimony revealed that the perpetrator is a Simic hybrid, an elf with frog-like features. They have the ability to climb walls and emit noxious gas. Given these details, Golovall, a representative of the Simic Combine, was convinced to cooperate with the investigation. Three suspects were identified matching the description from Martin's testimony. Besik Vistan, a veterinarian, Charlotte Novach, a courier, and Cassiel Abstani, a lab assistant. Vistan and Novach provided suitable alibis for their whereabouts on the night in question, but in discussions with Cassiel Abstani, it became clear that they were not acting of their own volition. Abstani's actions were being controlled by Vinzola, a vampire affiliated with the House Demia. Upon the discontinuance of the vampire's influence, it was determined that Abstani's memory had been modified. Though it is likely that they took the sun disc, they had no recollection of the incident. Abstani was transported to the chamber of the Guild Pact, where the Guild Pact commenced a memory restoration process. Our next steps. At the completion of the memory restoration procedure, we intend to obtain a testimony from Abstani detailing the events of the night in question, and we want to identify a motive for procuring the sun disc. Very good. I just have a few questions. How is your team working together as a unit? Oh, it's... Oh, yes. <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> he has got an angle to this. I don't care yeah. about his angle. I just want to know how Clerk feels deep down. Yeah. That's all I care about. Ever. Fair. It's been fairly successful. We get along great. Wow. That is remarkable to hear, Mr. Clark. You get along great. Even despite your different guild affiliations, you're able to work together in a productive and collaborative manner, you would say? All the time. Not a single disagreement, not ever. (laughs) I find that almost impossible to believe. Come on, I don't want to contaminate the data of this experiment. You can tell me if there have been obstacles to collaboration that need to be overcome. Hmm, obstacles to collaboration. Well, I feel like I've been a very effective leader, and they are very effective underlings. (laughs) There it is. There it is. Well, that is fantastic news. Look, I won't hide my own bias, but as this study goes forward, I don't want my personal interest to affect the data you're collecting. I was hoping this would be the case. There's a person in my life, a very important person who I care deeply about, but they aren't part of the League, you see. And because of these tensions that people feel towards each other, we can't really be honest about how we feel about each other. So knowing that this collaboration to solve complex problems is possible is extremely encouraging. And I hope this incident is not a fluke or an outlier. We have other pilot programs in operation now to test additional times, but your report is very encouraging to me, Mr. Clark. Glad it could be a service. You certainly are. I heard you were in the brainstorm attack. That's right. Your inquiry leads me to believe you're interested in the stolen object. Well, interested in it as far as... I want to know who would have a motive for taking it. How much do you know about Planeswalkers, Clark? Planeswalkers? Yes, I know it's something of a scare issue right now, after the invasion. Seems messy. Dangerous. Messy. Dangerous indeed. What if there were a way to stop Planeswalkers from going wherever they wished? Hmm. I think that'd be very popular around these parts. Yes. Yes, it would. The disc creates what I would call, from my investigation into it, an etheric lock. I might get into some technical terminology here, but the process of planeswalking is something that I have dedicated considerable study to. Oh, man. Now, there's a sort of membrane enclosing our world that keeps it separate from the others, and this membrane is comprised of a substance called ether. A planeswalker has the unique ability to cross this ether, but the sun disk in question, what is known as the immortal sun, causes an etheric lock. It prevents things from moving through ether and going from one world to another. Now, as it stands, if it were turned on, it would stop a planeswalker from being able to leave Ravnica. What my team were attempting to do was reverse the polarity, so to speak. So instead of keeping planeswalkers in, it could keep them out. A foolproof defense from future extraplanar incursions. Foolproof, you say? 
I am aware of the great damage that a fool can do, but hopefully foolproof. So, whoever took this immortal son doesn't want you to do that. Either that, or they're looking to hold some power over Planeswalker's ability to come and go as they please. May I speak freely? Yes. What's your opinion on this matter? How do you feel about Planeswalkers coming and going? (sighs) It's a complicated issue for me. I think that people should be able to freely move wherever they are able. That's my personal belief. But whoever took the sun hasn't yet activated it, or I would know. How would you know? Well, I told you. Planeswalkers and planeswalking is my area of expertise. Much of my experimentation and study over the past few years has been on the mechanics of the phenomenon. But with all due respect, you didn't answer my question. How would you know? Ah, you're gonna ring it out of me, aren't you, Mr. Clark? Respectfully. <laughs> well, it's not a terribly well-kept secret. I'm a planeswalker. You, you're, you're a planeswalker? Yes, yes. Gasp! Would it make sense for Clark not to know that? <laughs> yeah, it would make sense for Clark not to know that. I would say outside of the sphere of people who, like, deal with planeswalkers, people don't know who the planeswalkers are. Okay, that's amazing. Well, what planes have you been to? Well, most recently, I was on a plane called Alara. Strange world compared to ours. I was on a continent called Esper, where they are almost as skilled in the manipulation of metals and artifice as we are here. You don't say. Yes, there's a very rare enchanted alloy there called Ethereum. It has different properties to Mizium, but it has the same malleability when it comes to using it in conjunction with spellcraft. Wow. I have another question for you. I suppose I do have time before an angel comes to yell at me about why Tajik isn't getting his weapons order? Sure, shoot. Why us? There's a lot of detectives in this town. Why'd you choose us? We hardly seem like the right group for this. All this sleuthing around. Well, perhaps. But... Again, we tried using the powers of the Guild Pact to reclaim the Immortal Sun. It didn't work. Which leads me to believe that those groups that enforce the law and operate within the law may not be the best people to solve this problem. Your friends were picked from a number of groups of individuals who, during the invasion, were able to collaborate and work together to overcome some danger. You were chosen because your name showed up on a list, and I wanted someone from the League involved in this project. I appreciate you giving me this important job. I feel that it's in capable hands. Continue your observations and continue to produce results. You're dismissed. Yes, sir. Oh, one more thing. Yes, Mr. Clark? Uh, some people tried to kill us. Uh... People from House Demir, would it jeopardize the integrity of the experiment if we were to have a little bit more support in that department? You know what? I have just the thing. If you're worried about your safety, I can give you a bodyguard. He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a key. It looks to be made of blue and red quartz. There are some errant wires jutting off from it, and the head of the key is shaped like the face of a humanoid crackling with elemental energies. This is a key room. It's a (sighs) souvenir from my Maze Runner days. Hopefully it'll give you a bit more help than it gave me. If you activate it, it will turn into a weird that will protect you and... Do whatever else you commanded to do for three hours. At which point, um, it returns to key form for a couple of days before you can use it again. That's exactly what I had in mind. Well, hopefully it'll give you more luck than it gave me. Do you have a problem with it? When I was a maze runner, I believe the technical term for me would be a little shit. So, now that it's yours, please change the command phrase to anything other than Zarek rolls, Melek drools. Look, it's not a sore subject that I didn't complete the Dragon's Maze and become the Living Guild Pact. It's not a sore subject at all. I don't know anything about that. That's exactly what you need to say, Clark. He hands you the key and sort of waves for you to leave. I nod. It's sort of a half bow. Take the key and leave. Okay. That's where we can end this scene. You just introduced a lot of multiverse lore in that scene. I did. And I am really excited for it. <laughs> Boy, Alara's a hopping place. A lot of people been there. Yeah. 
<laughs> Alara is a hopping place. So if you are actually going to let Clork attempt to build some kind of vehicle, that is what he would do with his downtime. Okay. I'm going to try and find some point of comparison for this. If you want to go on to another scene and I can I can comb the book and kind of uh, propose something. Yeah, if you want to look up in the player's handbook, like how much a horse or a carriage would cost, that might be like a good starting place for me. And we can go on to, I think Alwyn wanted to do something. Cool. Yeah, this won't really take long. Sometime during my two weeks of mulling about the dank halls of Stonehaven, I want to see if I can find my way back to Lana. Okay, you can do that without too much issue. Make me a survival check with advantage, I would say. And when possible, I would have Pass Without Trace up if I'm traveling by myself. Okay. A survival dirty 20. And roll me stealth if you're trying to approach stealthily. I shall. That 20. Okay. 26 total. Yeah, you... You certainly sneak up on Lana as she's working. She's beginning to tear away all of this twisted overgrowth that came as a result of these magical agricultural projects smashing into each other. And she's mostly cleared out the cavern. You can see more rows of different fungi and root vegetables growing when you arrive. And she doesn't seem to notice you. Looking for a farmhand. Uh, uh, oh, um, well, hey, Alwyn. <laughs> I mean, it certainly wouldn't hurt. I feel like I'm probably another day or two before I clear out the rest of these... I guess weeds is really the only proper term. Mm, I thought I'd pay you a visit, see how things were going down here. They're going well. I can see that. She adjusts her glasses below her snaking tendrils. I can put some tea on if you're wanting to stay for a while. I don't suppose this is more than a pleasant visit? I have a few questions... If you don't mind the time, I can help you finish this out in exchange. I think I have an extra pair of shears lying around somewhere. Yeah, and while I kind of help her work at this... After dealing with Gullivol, we had quite a nasty run-in with some Demir assassins. I see. Seems the mark in question was being camped. I don't mean to pry into your life, but you said you knew my mother. If you don't mind me asking, how is it that you met your old friend? Roll persuasion with advantage. A flat 18. She twists a snake-like tendril around her finger. Well, things weren't always so flush for us Gorgons. When Gerard was running things around here, it, we Gorgons had to kind of stick together. And even before that, this would have been before you were born, but there was a time when all of us denizens of the Undercity were being rounded up and detained. The Senate wanted to flex their power and show that even the world below was not beyond their jurisdiction to impose order upon. Sounds about right. There were prison camps hastily made for a great number of the Golgari, especially those more magical creatures, Gorgons and trolls and the like. I'm sorry for bringing up such a painful subject. It's all right. We were able to fight and gain our freedom and return to this sort of normalcy, I suppose. I fought with your mother in those times and in other times after the fact. I'm sure she's very grateful for it. And I'm grateful for her. She is a good leader and a strong warrior. Aye, (laughs) that she is strongest to know. Down here in your corner of these tunnels, what would you know about forces outside of the Golgari and their operations? Sorry to say, not too much. Since your efforts, I've been somewhat comfortably isolated here. I don't hear too much, and I haven't been bothered over much as well. Mm. That's good to hear. Would the name Onel Gast mean anything to you at all? There's a chance. Sorry, doesn't ring any bells. Do I believe that? Roll inside. 16? She seems to be telling the truth. Just one more question, then. And thank you for being so open. Would you happen to know anything about those blue undead, those eternal warriors, the ones that were rounded up by the swarm, where they're being kept? And forgive me for asking, but this isn't something I feel comfortable taking to my mother. All I know is that Storev and the other necromancers don't want our people touching them. As far as where they're being kept, that's not something I need to know. Fair enough. 
The tunnel that we cleared out for Golivol, it had one lying at the bottom of it, still active. We managed to fight it off and defeat it, but, well, as you may know, they're supposed to need to be commanded. It's a bit odd. Mm. Odd indeed. The fact that they remember their training from life, as I understand it, makes them a bit more of a powerful weapon than your average shambler. I... I wish I could tell you more, Al, I really do. Oh, you've been plenty helpful. Well, so have you. She gestures to a pile of weeds that you've managed to clear out. You're welcome back here anytime. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll sort of hang around and share some tea and some company before I go. And yeah, that's it. That's what I wanted to do. So, Jimmy, what did you find about how much a horse costs? It's like way out of range. I mean, a horse is 50 gold, riding horse 75, but uh, we got a cart for 15 gold. Okay. Carriage is 100. Wagon is 35. It's all a little... I'm thinking like if you build it yourself, there's some sort of discount because, sure. you know, you're not paying for the labor that went into making it because you're providing all of that. Right. I would still say it probably in raw materials is going to cost about 50 Xenos to build some sort of vehicle. Okay. But you can get started on that and make some progress on it during these two weeks. Roll me an engineering check to see how much progress you make. Great. 13. Okay, and tell me how much are you spending on this? I think I'd be willing to spend, you know, 10, 12 right now. You spend 10 Xenos and you begin assembling the first wheel and axle of this contraption okay great um i also wanted to uh submit an expense report <laughs> while i'm at nivix <laughs> okay cool nice oh man. yeah so i don't have a lot of supporting documentation here maybe a couple of receipts from like the one time clork picked up the tab but i'm going to the accounting department fill out the paperwork and i'm looking for 10 gold okay. for lodging and provisions and transportation so far okay you send this to the guild pact's expenses office you get a letter back saying uh, we will verify these charges with divination you can expect reimbursement in 3 to 5 weeks 3 to 5 weeks oh, they got one person working in that office nonsense all right. Anything else people would like to do with downtime before we move on? Mm. I kind of want to spend a little bit of time either procuring with some of the money from our paycheck or putting together myself some more potions. Okay, sure. You're proficient in herbalism kits, right? Yep. Herb kit, medicine. Okay. Yeah. And I can spend, like, a bit of time every day down in the Undercity, like, looking for raw materials. Roll me a survival or medicine check. Okay. Survival 19. You're able to gather, let's say, it's a pretty good check. Um, I'm going to say 1d8 times 10 worth of raw materials for this. Okay. Oh, wow. Look at that. You're able to gather three potions worth of raw materials. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, and I'll start putting those together. Roll me again uh, a medicine check. 22. Very good. You are able to craft three regular healing potions. Hell yeah. Illipel, roll me a wisdom saving throw. Mm. 16. And now roll me a perception check. Not one. Okay. One night... You're staying at the Violet Rose, getting ready to go to sleep, and you hear a creaking sound, and you turn around, and the former owner of the Violet Rose, Anel Gast, is standing in your room. You motherfucker. (laughs) Hello, rat. Interesting. The den mother of the vermin herself. That's not a very polite greeting. Thank you for teaching me everything I know and then leaving such a well-established business in my capable hands would be better. Well, if you're not going to show any gratitude, I'd like it if you at least return the things you took from me. I know you well enough to know you've already taken them yourself. Well, then I guess I'd just like to know. She walks towards you and sticks a finger on your chest. 
Why I should permit you to keep living? While I trust your appetite for vengeance is at its most insatiable, I would remind you that while you climb the ranks of the Golgari, I climb the ranks of the Orzhov. And to that effect, sure, you may be able to strike me down right here when I am at my most vulnerable. But what you don't know, what you don't understand, is that I am also currently an agent working on behalf of the Guild Pact, helping run an investigation that involves stolen weaponry that may or may not influence the outcome of all of Ravnica. It's an elite squad, just three of us, all capable and deft in our own ways. If one of us were to go missing, you see how it would raise certain suspicions. Roll persuasion. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I don't know if Jeppy realizes. He, he probably does. The reason why we were chosen is so that if we went missing, nobody would care. Great. What Illipel is saying is completely agnostic of that. I thought so. Good news. It's a 28. <laughs> well, that's quite good. She considers your words. Thumbs at a lock of her silver hair, trailing with ivy. You're wrong about me, you know. I don't want vengeance. Not on you. Ah, I'll wait a hundred years and you'll be gone and this place will be mine again. You're keeping it warm for me. I'm willing to let the past go for now. Volatile as it is. I've moved on to bigger and better things. And she grabs your hand if you don't stop her. Specifically the lemniscate ring on your finger. And by the look of it, so have you. <gasps> I think it's no great mystery that both of us have always aspired to greater things than just some... Illipel gestures broadly at the building. Den, unassuming. No, we belong to far greater endeavors, both of us. We're too skilled for such simplicity. We'd have made a great team, to be sure, but... Our aspirations are our hubris. And people like us, Arnel, we simply can't coexist. Surely you understand. Is that really what you believe? I believe a suitable amount of space needs to exist between the two of us. Once upon a time, I believed that there were no reality in which each of us could get what we wanted. I have grown up a bit, to be sure. I'm not convinced we can't just leave each other alone for now. She leans in even closer. You can smell the mushrooms on her breath. I think that would be a very good idea, Elipel. You should keep yourself far away from my work and keep my name out of your mouth. That I can promise. I do suppose I owe you a gratitude for leaving the Violet Rose in such pristine order. So yes, you have my silence. Eternally. I thought I could convince you to be on your best behavior. Good evening, Mix Elipel. And she turns and you see her step into the shadows and she becomes absorbed by them and is gone. I will check to see what exactly she has taken. She has taken all the documents that were hers. I'm reading into the way you've described what you just said. Great. Okay, cool. Yes. And that will bring an end to the downtime. After two weeks, you receive a letter on Guild Pack Stationery. It has the ring of the ten symbols of the guild around the stylized silhouette of a dragon. The note on it says... We have a lead. Please report to work tomorrow at Alessander's Exquisite Attire, 488 King's Row, 1st Precinct. Exquisite Attire? What is... This makes its way to each of us separately, right? Yes, you each get your own individual letter saying that. Ah, Exquisite Attire. Sounds like I will need to meet the occasion. Illipel will take out one of their finest perfumes. Get ready for the big day tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Alwyn prepares his kit and... Makes his way back to the surface. With his brand new potions. Yeah. Keep you fuckers alive. <laughs> yep. So, assuming you all sort of show up at the place. Now, Illipel's not going to. Um, I'm done with the set, with the game. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess that's the end of this adventure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all You all arrive at Alessander's exquisite attire separately, I'm going to assume. Hmm. Probably. Okay, I'm going to roll to see who shows up there first. Clark, you're the first one in. You go to this finely appointed room with uh, bolts of cloth resting on long tables and tucked into the cubbies of tall shelves. There are several finished suits, dresses, and robes of sort of all sizes hanging from the wall. 
between sets of full-length mirrors. An older human stands behind the counter and is looking at you with a welcoming smile as the jingle of the bell announces your entry, and there appears to be another human in the room sitting on a couch. He's wearing sort of a formal lawyer's robe, and he's got several scroll cases on his back and a few scrolls under his arm. You feel like you may have seen him before. Hmm. Do I know you from someplace? Ah, yes. You must be Mr. Clark. Uh, Tomic Vrona, Viscopa Financial Services. He hands you a business card. Oh, yeah. I remember you. Clark members. From the Guild Pact. Yes, we met briefly. You are here to acquire an appearance that will not embarrass me. We are going to a party. A party? Well, party is a little blasé for the exact engagement. It is a clandestine meeting where the powerful exchange favors and objects of value. And why would I be required at a place like that? Because that is where our investigation has led us. I will tell you more when the rest of your associates arrive. Illipel, at this point you arrive. Oh. Oh, indeed. What a pleasure to see you again, my old friend. Likewise, (laughs) friend. And turning to the others in the room, I'm eager to hear where the next leg of our journey takes us. But we have one more critical member of this party to wait for. Master Illipel. It is good to see you. You are the one who I believe has the least pressing need for a garment that will not reflect badly on me. But you know what they say, you can never have too many bespoke outfits. Who says that? Anyone who is anyone, Mr. Clark. I see. Take heed of this person's words. It is rather true. You'll find yourself getting further and further away from the muck and muddle of the work you do on You know it. nothing of the work I do. Oh, I apologize, Pierre. I've struck a nerve. Into this argument arrives ah, Alwyn. That's the sound of argument that I have not missed. And now our gang, as they say, is all here. We are not a gang. We are professionals on a job. And now that you are all assembled, I will tell you what that job is. The searching of Cassio Obstani's memories revealed that the object we are looking for was delivered to a monthly gathering colloquially known as The Exchange. We believe there it was bought by another party, but we have been unable to find out exactly who the buyer was. We hope that if you can go to The Exchange and talk to the patrons there, you might be able to find the information you need to lead us, at last, to the missing disc. So you want us to go to a party and talk to people? Precisely. That's great, because I'm a really good talker. Wouldn't this sort of operation be best suited by, say, Illipel, and not all three of us? Both of you seem to have simultaneously taken the words right from out of my mouth. You all have unique talents. People that Illipel may have a rapport with may not be the only people in attendance. But Illipel is the only one who has the proper uniform for such a gathering, which is why I have asked you all here. As they're saying that, Illipel will kind of point at them and give a look that's like, see what I'm talking about? This is what I'm talking about. What's wrong with my uniform? A clerk gestures to his oil stains <laughs> and tattered overalls and his sweat stained undershirt. I gesture to the moss and mushrooms growing on the pauldrons of my great cloak these are very good clothes in the worlds that they come from but in my world the world of diplomacy and the subtle exchange of power and favors such attire would put you at a considerable disadvantage and as i am going to be your way in the door i would very much appreciate if you dressed the part alessander shuffles over And before both of you, strokes his gray beard and says, Oh yes, there's a lot of work to be done here. He conjures a couple of illusions of Alwyn and Clark, now dressed in formal (laughs) suits or robes. This is a baseline, but I want your input. I like to make my attire with care and consideration to the wearer. Tell me... Black. All black. That will be fine. And for you, my goblin friend, how do you envision the realization of your 
peak of elegance. Mm. Do you have anything reflective? <laughs> what the fuck? You know, shiny. As you say this, he gestures at the illusions. The robe that illusionary Alwyn is dressed in just switches to a very sharply tailored black robe. Oi, simple. Nothing wrong with simplicity. See, Illipel, it's not overstated. It doesn't ooze with a scent that would drive a sane man mad. And for you, Clark, he shifts the image and it shows now a tuxedo suit, but the bow tie on it is... It's made of a shining, glittery material, as well as the two buttons on the coat are also highly reflective, and the cufflinks are also very sparkly, and the shoes have a toe that has a bit of a reflective property to it. That's what I'm talking about. Very nice. Clark is going dressed as a disco ball. <laughs> <laughs> disco ball formal. Any other modifications you should like me to make? Can you make it red? Redder? It's a bit garish red and black. Well, how about red and blue? What about a purple? A purple is a regal color. Regal? I never thought of myself as regal before. But if you insist. He waves again at the illusion, and now it sort of shows Clark with a purple dress shirt under the tuxedo and purple socks. Fucking prime D&D right here. <laughs> 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 oh, one more thing. How about a hat? I know just the thing. He waves, and now the illusion of Clark is wearing a top hat. Yes. Who is that handsome fella? That's, that's it. That's Get it. that art <laughs> right now. That's what we want to see. I sort of wink to Illipel as I say, it would be a bit bigger, don't you think, Clark? The hat? If you're going to fully commit. All right, yeah. Can you make the hat bigger? Taller. Make the hat taller. And uh, the shoes could be bigger, too, I guess, while we're at it. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> All of my exquisite attire is bespoke, so everything will be very fitting, the shoes especially. However, I could add an inch or two to the top hat without making it too unwieldy. Mm. I gotta say, the character creator in D&D is just excellent these days. They've really, <laughs> they put a lot of effort into it. Paul Gates got nothing on this. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Go back to school, Larry, in studios. You'll know how to make a real character customizer. <laughs> top hat length, or get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important slider. It is the most yes. important slider of all. All right. Uh, Tomek speaks up. You will all also need to be masked. It is a tradition of the exchange. Masked? Yes, it is typical for a participant to wear a gilded mask to mm. maintain their anonymity. So I suppose I am asking, what sort of creature would you like to go masked as? I gotta think about that. I mean, Andy's obviously gonna say wolf. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't hard to, that wasn't a hard line to see. Well, you should say it. A wolf, pale green, white, either is fine. Very good. And for the others of you, a peacock for you, Master Illipel? Or a rat, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I trade information, but I do not give it away freely. I'm no rat, as you describe. But, well, a peacock does sound rather elegant. I think something a little more understated may be best to go alongside my fellow companions. Let's do a fox, shall we? A fox, a splendid choice. And what of you, Master Clark? Mm. Real quick, I googled, like, quick, just sneaky animals, conniving animals, and just the first result was Californian ground squirrel. <laughs> See that <again>? <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, a drake or a firsmaka. Both good options. Can you do a phoenix? A phoenix? Yes, a splendid creature. I have heard tell of your laboratories creating magnificent phoenixes. Yes, a phoenix would be doable. A fox, a phoenix, and a wolf. Splendid. Can't fox with that. Pfft. Ew. Does anyone else want to go as a blue-footed booby? It is a bird. I shall just need to take your measurements briefly, and your dress should be recoverable tomorrow by... 5 p.m. Okay. Yeah. He takes you each into a back room, takes your measurements. While this is going on, I sort of turn to Talmic. This is a sort of event that I can assume they don't want weapons or any other sort of equipment brought in. 
I was going to mention this. Weapons, no, unless you can conceal them, or oftentimes the guards are persuadable with the correct weight of gold, but I believe that is something beyond your financial ability to achieve. And is it beyond your financial ability to achieve? Not beyond my ability, but beyond my desire. Understood. I should hope there will not be a conflict breaking out at this social event. That's too bad. We're getting pretty good at fighting. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yes. So either conceal your weapons or leave them at your homes. And uh, what if I was to carry in like a big wrench, for instance? I did instruct you to not do anything that would reflect poorly on me. I am wondering, do you think this would reflect well on me if you were to carry in a large wrench? Mm, maybe it's like a fashion statement? Kind of matches my outfit. Metallic. Well, your hat's going to be so big, you could just stuff it under that. Hey, now you're thinking. I sort of size up the jacket that the image of myself was wearing and look at my gavel, trying to see if maybe I could conceal it. There's definitely places where you could, beneath the stylish black robe that Alessander has presented you, probably would require some sort of sleight of hand check to do so. Is it that we have to leave all of our stuff at our homes, or can we leave all of our stuff nearby, quote unquote? So, just to be clear, if you leave your weapons at the door, they'll, like, coat check them for you, right? They're not going to lose them. They're not going to take them. This is a proper establishment, and it's not uncommon for a person to go armed around the streets. It's a dangerous city. Nobody knows what might happen. Uh, if you're looking for storage, they will provide it. Okay. For probably a nominal enough fee that Tomic would cover it for you. What a swell individual. If there are no other questions, I ask to meet you at Vuliev's mausoleum tomorrow night, not later than 8 p.m. All right. What sort of interested parties can we expect? Do you have any details? The precise guest list changes month to month, but usually those involved are either Orzhov financiers or ambitious Azorius senators and representatives looking to secure more campaign financing. Crooked fucking politicians. Precisely. Wait, you didn't say that in character. Never mind. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's funny that it still got a response. I liked that. Other than that, uh, you know, socialites, powerful mages, anyone who might be looking to acquire unique oddities or the favor of someone powerful. Is this the sort of thing that a scavenger might sell to? Generally, no. It's something that you would sell to someone and they would probably sell at this. Got it, got it. Okay. And I suppose if there's nothing else to be done here, we can end the session there and pick it up as you arrive at Vuliev's mausoleum in your formal dress and masks. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me with music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake, May, and Chris. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening.